Amen. We'd like to welcome everybody to Souls of Bay. If we got any first time guests, we'd like to welcome them. Please let our usher know. They like to be so. I'll fly away. One day I will. Uh, we serve a Savior. He is busy. And He's alive. I pray that we will come together, rejoice, and praise His holy name. Anybody had a birthday or anniversary? Okay. Uh, are there any names to be mentioned on our prayer list? I encourage you to take a book to home. That's got all our announcements in. God bless. Yes, ma'am. That's very special.
morning. Thank you for being here this morning. Um, it came from over here, the Gore and who family? Lily. Lily is the last name? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for being here this morning. We're glad that you're here. And uh, are y'all warm? It's cold outside. Tell you what. I'm, I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm ready for a little bit of warm weather. Amen. And uh, I think it's time. We're getting ready to go to the Lord in prayer. And as you pray, I'd we'll love to re uh, call out loud the names again. Uh, Aunt Sue, Kenneth Kelly, Gore Lilly family, Roscoe Hughes family, the Hendricks family, and I know there's others. And uh, it's so sad to hear about Mr. Roscoe. I didn't know about his death until this morning here at prayer breakfast. And, uh, Brother Sonny is here with us this morning. His mother went home. Was her service Thursday, sir? Thursday, yes. sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Praying for Mr. Sonny. Glad to have him and his family here this morning. And uh, I know it's safe to say that we all have a prayer best on our heart this morning. Yeah, we sure do. <coughs> uh, Rita Moore is home. David texted us this morning that uh, she is battling vertigo. <coughs> and uh, and uh, if I could echo what Lisa said, that Wings ministry is such a blessing uh, to, to the children. Uh, I've been told by uh, uh, school administration from not just Baltimore, but a lot of the schools. I've been told by Miss Missy Settlemeyer that if it wasn't for that backpack, that the children would not eat on Friday when they leave school until Monday when they came back to school. So uh, thank you for being a, a part of that. I would like to put a bin out there for uh, for me, for Pop-Tarts, uh, if, um, if you're so led. Um, I'm just kidding. I'm blessed. And, uh, just wanted to get you smiling just a little bit this morning. But if you would, let's take our smiles. Our joy and our thankfulness to God the Father at this time of prayer. <coughs> Father, again, we come to you uh, standing in awe. When we really think about what you've allowed us to be a part of today, and that's coming to your house of worship, uh, to worship you. And Father, it's for grace we come, and it's for grace we receive from you. And Lord, we just want to pause. And Lord, I pray right now that we literally pause, bow our heads, bow our hearts to you, and spend time in this prayer together. Father, I pray right now that everyone's praying and not listen to me pray. Father, our cares and concerns have, have been mentioned out loud. The names of uh, Mr. Kelly, who's dealing with stage four lung cancer. And it's safe to say, Lord, as he's dealing with that disease, that the family is standing by, processing, caring, and loving and hoping. And Father, we have families, the Hendricks family, the Hughes family, the Gore and Lily family, Lord, that's dealing with the death of a loved one. Father, it's safe to say that that death really ripples farther than just the family. But it goes through all the relationships that, that individual has. And Father, we pray right now that you bring a comfort, that you bring a peace that nobody else can. Father, I know for a fact this morning, as we look at the calendar, uh, there are still those that are dealing with death and grieving. If you allow me, like for a, a month ago, two months ago, maybe years ago. And Lord, that's just it. We never ever truly get over the death of love. But Father, you're a God of comfort. You're a God of healing. 
You're a God of restoration. But also, Lord, you're a God of promises. That you've given to us and you've extended to us through your word of where our loved ones have gone. But it's to believe. Father, you've given us a way. That's why we go back to grace and we go back to mercy. That this morning may be the day for some to realize that they're lost. That they don't have that relationship with you. Father, if we don't have the relationship with you, we don't have the promises that you give. We have the certainties. But Father, this morning you want all your people to be believers and to anchor their hope in the truth of God's Word. Father, we pray for Aunt Sue this morning who will be having an upcoming procedure. Father, again, we pray for the, the guidance of the physicians, the nurses, the staff, equipment, OR, all that's involved, Lord. We pray for her. We lift her up to Father, on my mind this morning, it seems like a, in several conversations since last night, we're reminded of the man that's lost the delay. That emergency services are continuing to search and to look. Father, we just pray for the emergency services. We pray for the family. Lord, we pray that gentleman is located. I don't know his name. I don't know nothing else other than what I've just prayed. But Father, we know that you're all known. You can provide what's needed. So Lord, in speaking of that providing, will you give us this morning what we need? Father, would you remove anything that's a stumbling block or a hindrance to receiving that what we need? And Father, as we continue to praise you with song of those promises that one day we'll fly away because there's victory in Jesus. As we continue to worship, we open the Word, the choir sings, we give, we pray. We ask for your anointing. Father, we ask and we're grateful for those that are here. Father, we pray for those that are not here for whatever reason. And Lord, this morning, what would mean more than anything is you being a part of this service as we continue. Father, we pray for that only the Holy Spirit to be here among us. Father, it's safe to say that as the people sit out there this morning, at around 8 o'clock this morning, where their sitting's been praying. The person has been there in prayer, has sat there, or has walked by. Father, this day has been saturated with prayer. We know you're obedient when we pray, and we pray that we're obedient when you move. Father, we ask that you bless as we turn our hearts to the offer, our tithes. Father, we pray for the offering that's going to be received today, that we use it to advance your kingdom, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we ask as always that you bless the gift, multiply, bless the giver, extend it in blessings, Lord, for being obedient. And move in a way this morning, Lord, that we not only think about our time, but we think about what we do for you. None will never outdo what you've done for us. Again, we go back to grace. Father, thank you for spending this time with us in prayer. Thank you for hearing. Thank you for your answers. Father, every second that's led, every second that's led for this service, may it be pleasing to you. Father, will you smile upon us this morning? Will you show your face? We pray that you do. We pray that we see it be. Fathers, all things are asked in that name that's above every name, the name of Jesus Christ. It's in that name we ask this prayer. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.
Bibles with you that you brought from home. I would love for you to turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 1. We're continuing our study in the book of Acts. I'll go through this book uh, prayerfully, unless the Lord uh, moves different. Uh, I hadn't intended it for to be uh, intended for it to be verse by verse, but uh, that's what uh, God's doing, so I'm grateful for that. I hope you are too, uh, to be able to uh, learn some things uh, about the, the coming of the Holy Spirit and, and the church, the first church, uh, and the act of the Holy Spirit as we get in the book, the, God, the book of Acts. It's also called the Acts of the Apostles. got something really on my mind this morning and I've been praying and I'm just going to confess to you I spent a little bit longer in prayer about some things and mainly this sermon and I just want it to, uh, I want God to bless and I want me to, uh, to be removed and get out of the way. Are you coming to preach? <laughs> I'd rather you preach than me. No, you're fine. Okay, we'll just wait on Myra. I'll pay for that later. But uh, not a problem, Myra. Not a problem. But um, where was I? Oh, somebody how God moved. Myra interrupted. Um, um, but seriously, I'll pay for that later. I just got something on my heart this morning, and and I really, my prayer really, really that you just, please, I want you to set aside everything this morning. What you've got going on. And I want the God of the Word, and I want the Word of God to speak to you this morning. God wants to help us. Can I just be that simple? God wants to help us. God has never intended to hurt us. And He wants to help us. And I, I just I, I just want you to get the busy out of the way. Last Sunday, we celebrated Easter. And we thank God for that. And, and last Sunday through the Scripture, we looked at the, the last day now, I understand, okay, all what happened after that, but just hear me for this morning. We, we looked at his last day alive on earth. We looked at his death. And then we looked at his first day back alive on earth. And we, we, we hung out with Mary Magdalene last Sunday and the, and the disciples. More specifically... Uh, John and Simon Peter. But this morning, where God has us in His Word, what's, what's coming is His last day on earth. Now church, young people, please, please stay with me. I know, and I hope you know, He's coming back. Hey. Okay? I know He's coming back. But in the Scripture this morning, 
And we're, we're, we're not going to get there to unpack it. But we're going to read His last day alive on earth. If you're physically able, will you please stand in reverence to the Word of God as we look at Acts chapter 1, starting with verse 6. If you're there, will you say amen? amen. The Bible says in verse 6, When they therefore were come together, I want to stop there for just a second. They means the disciples. It is not the hundred and some in the upper room. It is just the disciples. And they've gathered in this place, and I'm going to get to it in just a moment, and Jesus is, going, is getting ready to share with them some information. Now, the reason, and we're not going to really bog down here, but the reason I feel that it's just the disciples is we get the disciples by name in verse 13. And we're not going to read there, but if you want to make a draw line or something, we get the disciples' names in 13. And then, days later in verse 15, we have Simon Peter stand up and address the number of 120. So, if you can imagine with me this morning, you know I like to kind of prick your brain at times to imagine and get yourself there. And, and we're there, and it's Jesus and the eleven disciples. And when they therefore were come together, they asked of Him, saying, Lord, will Thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in His own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto Me both in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen Him go into heaven. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray right now for Your Word to speak to our heart, that, Father, that I decrease and You increase, and that everything that's said, done, and thought here brings glory to You, the Father. It is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. So we have the disciples here, the 11 disciples. Uh, Judas has committed suicide. And we have Jesus and the disciples there. And where they're at, Mr. Curry, if you'll get ready, where they're at is the Mount of Olives. Now, they have left... They have left... Uh, sir? Which one? Matt, please. Uh, you see there, do you? Yes. You see there, and I just wanted to kind of... Uh, uh, Get your mind where we're at here. You see they have come out of Jerusalem uh, near Bethany. Uh, and right above Bethany, that dot there above the town of Bethany is actually the town called Bethpage. We've read that. We've studied that. And exactly where the red, uh, whatever that is, uh, where the red thing is, is the Mount of Olives. And it is where, now if you'll go to modern day, I wanted to show you exactly to kind of get your mind where, where we're at, what's going on. We know where, we know who. This is a current, is that not beautiful? That is modern day, the Mount of Olives right outside of Bethany. So, probably safe to say, it was greener, it was more luscious there than modern day uh, at the Mount of Olives. But you can kind of see the slant on the land as it goes up uh, into form of a mountain. So, some years ago, Jesus and His disciples were standing there where you're looking. Now, that's modern day uh, Mount of Olives, but Jesus was standing there. And, Kurt, if you just want to, just leave that up there if you want, unless you have something else, sir. But, uh, but that's where we're at. And what I want us to look at this morning as we unpack this verse is, I've titled this morning, The Power from on High. 
the power from on high. And not this morning, but uh, excuse me, but this morning we're going to look at in verse 6 the disciples' passion. The disciples' passion. Then we're going to see Jesus' promise, the disciples' promotion, Jesus' prediction, and then God's prophecy. And that's the lineup as we'll be moving through these verses. But in verse 6, I want you to understand that we're looking at this morning the disciples' passion. And in verse 6, the Bible says, When they, therefore, were come together, they asked of Him, saying, Lord, will Thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? We are looking at the disciples' passion. Now I want to ask you a question this morning. As we unpack this verse, I want to ask you, what are you passionate about this morning? What are you, what do you care about this morning? I've asked you to clear your mind. I've asked you to get our busyness away from us this morning and solely concentrate on the message from God and God's Word, from God's Word. We see this morning, have you ever dealt with anybody in your workplace or even at home or whatever, and you've explained something to you and then they give you this look? You understand what I'm saying? And then you explain it again and you still get that look. So you know you just really got to break it down to just small, 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 small particles so you can explain what you really want somebody to get. And sometimes they, uh, they, 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 just, they just don't get it. Uh, uh, Toby and I were in the rescue squad with a lady, and uh, she was a dear lady. She's already gone on to heaven uh, to be with her Lord, and, and uh, she was a, an intermediate, and we, we would have continuing education at the rescue squad, and we'd bring in train, uh, instructors in the rescue squad, and, and uh, the instructor, he or she, would explain something, and uh, we could, there's, it, there's always that one person, right? <laughs> okay, Dear lady, dear lady, and, and she'd go, after it was all over, she'd go, I don't get it. So the instructor would go at it at a different angle, and we'd all look at this dear lady. And we could tell by her face if she got it. And she goes, I don't get it. So I have always remembered to say every now and again, when I just don't understand something that's trying to be explained to me, I always say, I don't get it in her memory. But can I share something with you this morning? The disciples didn't get it. They didn't get it. They are still dealing with their passion. They are still dealing with themselves. They are still waiting and wondering what in the world is going on. And, and can I, can, can, you'll be putting it more in the vernacular. What's in it for me, 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 me? That's what, and I'm going to tell you, when you're thinking about, when you're looking at what's in it for you, that is your passion. It's you. So we see this more than the disciples' passion. But, but, I just want to ask you a question. This isn't preaching. I'm just going to ask you a question. Are you thankful this morning that Jesus is patient when we just don't get it? Can somebody say me? We need to thank God for being patient with us when we just don't understand something. When we just don't get something. And it was in this study that I came up with this. This is an original thought. Emily, if you want to tweet it, I'd love for you to and quote me. But this is an original thought that I had. Your depth of patience equals the width of your love. The depth of your patience equals the width of your love. Are you patient with some people, but not others? Some of you in customer service, you deal with some customers over and over and over again. Some of them you're very patient with. Some of them take all the life out of you when you see their face. Your children. Some of us are more patient with our children than we are anybody else. Maybe it's your spouse. You're more patient with your spouse. Or let me say, you should be more patient with your spouse. And a lot of times I think the, pay, the level, the, the depth of your patience equals the width of your love. And I, Tyler, I think we can put that on God. Because God 
You can say what you want. God is very patient with the church today. God is patient with the non-believers today. And if you're sitting here this morning, if you're sitting here, I'm just going to get preach a minute. If you're sitting here this morning and you are not saved and you're still drawing breath, you need to thank God that He's patient with you. He has extended to you mercy. You are still alive by the grace of God. And you might need to change some things this morning with God. And Jesus has shared with them. Jesus had shared with them. Jesus had shared with them numerous times what was going to happen. And they still looked at Him. They were still thinking and asking, uh, Lord, uh, uh, I'm just asking, uh, just curious about something. Um, are things going to get better for us? Can I put it in very simple terms? This might not even be, um, I know it's biblical, but my word usage may not be all that correct. But I want to break the history right down for you from the Bible. At this point, the disciples thought the Son of Man, the Messiah, was going to be their new governor. They knew the Son of Man. They knew the Messiah. But they didn't know the Son of Man and they did not know the Messiah. And you may be here this morning knowing this Jesus that we've talked about, that we have sung about this morning, but you do not know Him as far as a personal relationship with Him. And if you don't know Him, you're not getting the blessings and the benefits from Him. Because of your passion. Because of your passion. You see, Judea at one time was under their own power. They've been stripped. This is just a little history so it kind of sets the tenor to tone of what's going on. Of why they're still confused. Of why they're still wondering and worried about their governor. You see, they've been stripped of their power. And because of that, they were now under the Roman rule. And they just didn't like it. Let me make it modern day for you. I've heard some people say, and I don't care what's on you, I don't care your political party. I really don't. Honestly, I do not care. But I want to share with you something. It's like, uh, and I'll just use these two because they're recent. It's like Barack Obama was in office and some of you supported him as president. And some of you didn't support him as president. And you were waiting for that change. And now today we find Donald Trump in the office. And some of you support him. And some of you don't. And you're waiting for, uh, you're waiting for my president to get in office. And that's exactly what the disciples were doing. And can I just say parenthetically in regards to who's in office, you better be praying for him. Uh, but anyway, they had been reduced to a Roman province. And they, so that put them under the Roman rule and under the Roman governor. And they were just simply waiting for a new governor. And they just knew. They just knew it was going to be Jesus. But what was, what was very fuzzy here, and I want to I preach this. What was very fuzzy here, and funny, but not comical at all. But they were only worried about their life on earth. They were not concentrating on their eternity. Now wait just a minute because that will preach. What are you passionate about this morning? Let me do it like this. What are we, what are we passionate about this morning? Is it earthly? Can I share with you that everything on this earth, as you know, one day is going to be gone? The Bible says, John said more specifically in Revelation chapter 21, there's going to be a new earth. What are you passionate about this morning? Today, I just want to ask you, I've asked you to clear your mind. Today, have you thought about the day or have you thought about eternity? See, they were thinking about today. What are you, what are we so called up in about today? Brother Don, shouldn't we have a passion for eternity? For eternity. 
your passion is either about yourself, me included, or your passion this morning is about others. Now wait just a minute. Wait just a minute. I want you to understand something. I don't know a lot, but I know a little bit. I'm not talking about the passion of others. Now watch this. I want to show you something. I'm not talking about <coughs> you being passionate about your spouse or your fiance. I'm not talking about you being passionate about your children. I'm not talking about you being passionate about your grandchildren. Now watch this. Some of you are going to faint. I'm not even talking about being passionate about the return of Jesus. Hang out there for just a moment. I'm going to come back. I'm talking about I want us to get off the surface stuff, church. I want us to get on the heart level. I want us to get on the forgiveness level. I want us to get on the love level of God the Father. That what we're supposed to be extending to each other, meaning this church and outside the church in the community. I am sick and tired of dealing with the surface stuff. I'm talking about being in love with God the Father. I'm talking about being in love with Jesus Christ. I'm talking about being passionate about what God has done for me and you. That's what I'm talking about this morning. Not the surface stuff anymore. I'm talking about the Matthew 25 stuff. I'm talking about when you were hungry, you gave me something to eat. I'm talking about when you were thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I'm talking about when you were naked, you put clothes on my back. That's the stuff I'm talking about this morning because that's when the church is the church. Amen. That's when the church is a church. And I want, you to sh I want to share something with you what's going on in these scriptures this morning. And the reason that you are, if you're here this morning, and you may vote me out tonight, but I've had a good time while I've been here. And I'm going to tell you, you may be passionate about yourself, but I want you to understand something. If you never hear anything else I say today, or anything else I've ever said, you listen to what I'm getting ready to say. I may, not be, I may be dumb, but I'm not ignorant. I want to go and tell you the reason you need to shift your passion this morning. The reason the disciples needed to shift their passion that day and not look at Jesus as some governor, but look at Him as God the Father is because we're not setting up your kingdom. We're setting up God's kingdom. Amen. It is Jesus, 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 He is setting up His kingdom. We are not concerned with our kingdom. So what are you passionate about this morning? Is it your kingdom? We're not setting it up, sir, ma'am. See, time is not time as far as a sense of being time that's going to go on and go on and go on and go on and the wheels on the bus go round and round. Time is going to be on the matter of fact of the fact that Jesus Christ is returning. And at that point, eternity will be established if you allow me. What are we passionate about this morning? Well, our passion should not be reward driven. Our passion should not be reward driven. It should not be about position, power, possessions, prestige, physical, or ruling and reigning. It is, should not be about that. Because Jesus Christ is setting up, I'm saying it again, He is setting up. His kingdom. In Matthew 4, 17, I want to share with you, I'm going to give you three verses of Scripture if you want to put them in your margin. Moving fast. In Matthew 4, 17, the Bible says, from that time Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Matthew 10, 7, more specifically, Jesus said, and as you go, preach, say, the kingdom of God is at hand. In Matthew 6.10, we get the, what we call the Lord's Prayer or the Disciples' Prayer. The Bible says in Matthew 6.10, Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in church, say it, heaven. That's the kingdom of God that's being set up. Not yours and mine, sir, man. Not yours and mine. Where's our passion? Our passion should not be reward-driven. Our passion should be responsibility driven. Our passion should be responsibility driven. Now, there's one thing 
that really, really bothers them. And I know there's things that bother you. But the one thing that bothers me is people today not accepting responsibility. Don't hate me. I'm not being mean. I don't know what that means, right? I get ready to be mean. Let's just watch this a second. I just want the Spirit of God to move, okay? Just watch this a second. I am tired of people today not accepting any responsibility. If you agree with that, if that bothers you, will you just say me too? You know what should bother us more? Is Christians not accepting their God-given responsibility. Does that bother you? I'm just asking. Why are we shucking off our responsibility to someone else? The responsibilities that's been given to the Christians by Jesus Christ should bother us when we do not do them more than people not accepting responsibility for their actions. It's time for the church to have a passion about our responsibilities. See, the disciples were still not getting their responsibility. So in verse 7, and I'm closing. In verse 7, and I'm going to unpack this more tonight, and I pray you'll be back. We have Jesus rebuking the disciples. In verse 7, the Bible says, And He said unto them, Jesus saying, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put. In whose power? His own power. In your kingdom? Huh? In my kingdom? <laughs> In God's kingdom. Easter, the Sunday night before Easter, I went, as soon as we were done here, I went down to Zion and watched their Easter drama. And a lot of the church family here went. And poor old Landis. At the end of the Easter drama, Wes has already preached the gospel. He got real. He was scripture. As always, he was saying. And it was so real, Miss Chief. Rhonda drove that night. We met here and then we rode down to get designed. On the way back, I dropped Rhonda off. Actually, I opened the door and pushed her out. I'm just kidding. I dropped Rhonda off, and Bethany says, Mama, I'm going to ride home with Dad. Well, I knew something was up. I figured it was girl drama, boy drama. Just what I call 12-year-old drama. And as soon as Rhonda got out of the car, Bethany says, Daddy, i got two questions. I said, okay, what are they? She said, um, what Mr. Landis was saying there at the end. Is that really going to happen? And what Pastor Landis said at the end was, he's coming back. Are you ready? I said, yes, and he is coming. She said he was talking about, and he did. She said he was dead. He was talking about the end times and how everything's kind of, now this is Bethany's words, not mine, how everything's kind of shaping up. I said, 
Yes, ma'am. And now, I want you to understand, Landis gave his disclaimer that he does not know. He was not predicting. He was sharing his intelligence about what he knows about the Word of God. But I'm going to tell you what. He had my daughter's attention. He had a 12-year-old's attention. Can I just ask a question? Has God got your attention yet? I said, Bethany, I said, I know at 12 years old. Well, I'll tell you, honey, at 43. Joey, there's times I want to go on yeah, There are. There are tough times. There's times I want to go on. But there's times I don't. I want to see my daughter grow up. I want to see how wrong it's going to happen. She's 80. <laughs> <laughs> we already know, don't we? So. <laughs> Margaret Simmons is not dead, by the way, y'all. There's Tessa here. Anyway. <laughs> but in all seriousness, there's days I don't want to go. There's times I want to go. But I want to share with you something. I want you to understand the reason I shared this is I wanted to set this moment up. I had to share with Bethany what Jesus said in verse 7. Honey, nobody knows the time. Nobody knows the season. Jesus does not even know the week. One day, God's going to look at His Son and say, go get my bride. Is that your passion this morning? Is what my passion this morning, Jason? May I put it like this? When Dwight L. Moody was in London during one of his famous evangelistic tours, Several British pastors visited him. Now listen, please. I've already told you I'm done. But I still need you to get rid of the busy. Several British pastors went to see him. And Miss Faye, they asked him. They wanted to know how and why this poorly educated American was so effective at winning throngs of people to the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Moody took the men in the hotel and he walked them to the window. And he says, Pastors, I want you to look out that window and tell me what you see. They looked out the window and they said, Well, this a park. There's people walking in the park. D.L. Moody said, that's your problem. Those aren't people walking in the park. Those are souls going to hell if they don't have the same. So my question is, who was poorly educated? See, That should be our passion this morning. Jason, I cannot do that. Why not? You have the power from on high. Father, as our musicians come to several things on our mind this morning. Is our passion out of line? The other thing, Lord, is how do we look at people? Father, another
attitude is that about how we feel about you? We've talked about patience this morning. We've talked about love. Father, I can't help but wonder. I'm not, I'm not being, please Lord, no. Church, please no. I'm not being arrogant or bold. But Father, during this invitation that's yours, I can't help but wonder, will anybody be in heaven because of me? <coughs> We all ask ourselves that question. With head bowed and eyes closed. I want to ask you a question. In Revelations chapter 2 and chapter 3, Christ wrote letters to seven churches. told them their weaknesses. Told them their strengths. But I couldn't help but wonder this morning, Soldier Bay. I know the divine inspiration of writing is, is over with. But his word is still timeless. And Soldier Bay, I couldn't help but wonder. What would Jesus say about Soldier if you wrote us a letter today. Father, thank you for this time. Have your will and way. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard the, the invitation. I just pray that you're obedient. Maybe you're here this morning and you're wanting to make Soldier Bay your home church. I will share with you that we want you here if you feel like that's where God wants you to be. Or here's where God wants you to be. Will you please recall the invitation? The altar is open. Are you saved? Do you have a relationship with Christ? Have you backslidden? What does that mean? Are you in love with Jesus today more than you were yesterday? If you're not, you backslid. Will you please stand?
is good. All the time. And all the time. God Thank you. God bless you. We have worship service tonight at 6 o'clock. I'd love for you to come and be back with, with us if you don't mind. Uh, does anybody have anything to say or add? Anything I'm forgetting or you just want to brag on God? I'll ask Brother Don Evans if we will close us in prayer. Anything? Thank you. Congregation, I love you. It's an honor being your pastor. God bless you. Father, we've heard about your direction. What should be our passion is your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And that relationship with Him, not the blessing that we have in life or the things that we want. Jesus in our heart, directing and guiding and empowering us to be your witness and your servant. It's in his name we lift up every concern on every mind.